Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. The communion, um, what we call the Last Supper, the Christian communion, where we remember um, the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. And a study of the Lord's Supper can be a soul-stirring experience because there's a real depth of meaning to it. And it was during this sort of age-old celebration of the Passover on the eve of his death that Jesus instituted a new and significant fellowship, uh, a fellowship meal, if you like, that we observe to this day and that we're going to do uh, after I've spoken. You see, and it causes us to remember Jesus' death and resurrection and to look forward to his glorious return in the future. And in Mark 14, it tells a story between verses 12 and 26. And verse 22, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. See, the Passover was the most sacred feast of the Jewish religious year. Way back in history, um, the Jewish nation had been trapped in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. So for 1,300 years, up until the time of Jesus' Last Supper, they had celebrated every year this Passover event. Because what happened? God sent a bunch of plagues into Egypt. And these plagues were sent to convince Pharaoh to let the Jewish nation go, to let them go. And the Passover commemorated the final plague on Egypt when the firstborn of the Egyptians died. And the Israelites were spared because the blood of a lamb that was sprinkled on the doorposts, on the frames of the door to their houses. And it's interesting that the lamb that they had to sacrifice, that they had to kill and put the blood on the boast, had to be without defect, it had to be perfect. The lamb was then roasted and eaten with unleavened bread. And God's command was that throughout the generations to come, the feast would be celebrated. And you can read all about the story in the second book in the Bible, which is called Exodus, and in chapter 12. So, you know, Jesus was a, we know he was fully God, he was fully man, and he had some close friends, his 12 disciples. And they were celebrating the Passover. And during this celebration, this Passover meal, he took a loaf of bread and he gave thanks to God. And as he broke it and gave it to his disciples, he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup of wine and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And then he concluded the feast by singing a hymn. And Margaret said, we were talking about this, yet, it's the first time she'd actually registered that they sung a hymn. So they had their meal, they had their supper, they had shared the bread and they shared the wine. And then they sang a hymn, and they went out into the night to the Mount of Olives. And it was there that Jesus was betrayed, as predicted by Judas. And the following day, he was crucified. Now, you can find the accounts of this Last Supper in all of the Gospels. That's the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the Apostle Paul wrote concerning the Lord's Supper in 
1 Corinthians, a letter that he wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 11 and verses 23 to 29. And it includes a statement which is not found in the gospel accounts. He said, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So what does, that, what does it mean? What does that mean, you might ask, to partake of the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner? Well, it might mean to disregard the true meaning of the bread and the cup and to forget the tremendous price that Jesus paid for our salvation. Or it may mean to allow the ceremony to become a dead and formal ritual or to come with unconfessed sin. So in keeping with Paul's instructions, we should examine ourselves before we take the bread and the wine. And it's easy, isn't it, to, for these things, these things that we do to become just mundane and just part of a routine. And we, can, we get up, we walk to the front, we take the bread, we take the wine, and we go back and we sit down without really thinking about what it means and why it's important. It should never become a meaningless ritual. If you're going to engage in this, then you should do it with a right heart, with a right understanding. Otherwise, don't engage in it. Jesus doesn't want you to. If you don't believe in him, if you don't trust in him, then this is not for you. Another statement Paul made that's not included in the gospel accounts is, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And for me, that places a time limit on the ceremony until our Lord's return. So from these brief accounts, we learn how Jesus used two of the frailest elements, bread and wine, as symbols of his body and his blood. And he initiated them to be a monument to his death. It wasn't a monument to be carved in marble or molded brass, but of bread and wine. If you watch the news this week, you will have seen that uh, they've named, in Portugal, they've renamed an airport after Cristiano Ronaldo. He's a very talented footballer, um, probably the best in the world. One day he might play for Newcastle. Okay, that's a dream, but it might, you know, you never know. And what they did was they had some uh, sculptor create a bust of his head. And they unveiled it with Cristiano Ronaldo standing next to it. And there was kind of laughter and social media went wild because it kind of looked nothing like him. Um, it's quite a funny, it's like a spitting image, really. If anybody remembers the spitting image program. Um, but that's going to be there f like forever, you know, for a long time anyway, until they demolish the airport or whatever. And every time anyone comes in, they'll see this Cristiano Ronaldo um, uh, brass bust thing. And that's a monument to Cristiano Ronaldo. And it's a monument cast in brass to recognize what he's done. And although, uh, and I would say this, Cristiano Ronaldo is a great footballer, but he also is quite a philanthropist and he does a lot of work for charity and he does a lot of work with young and privileged children. Um, so that's great. But for Jesus, he didn't want an image made from human hands. He didn't want a monument of cast bronze, he said, this bread and this wine represent my body and my blood shed for you. He declared that the bread spoke of his body which would be broken. And we know from the accounts of his crucifixion that not a bone in his body was broken, but his body was so badly tortured that it was, <clears throat> it was hardly recognizable. Read Psalm 22 or Isaiah 53 um, to get the picture. And if you've ever watched Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, you will have seen a pretty graphic depiction of what Jesus suffered for you and for me. The wine spoke of his blood, indicating the terrible death that would, he would soon experience. 
the perfect Son of God, became the fulfillment of countless Old Testament prophecies concerning a Redeemer. And when he said, do this in remembrance of me, he indicated that this was a ceremony that must be continued into the future. He indicated also that the Passover, which required the death of a lamb without defect, um, and look forward to coming the, to the coming of the Lamb of God, who would take away the sin of the world. It was fulfilled in the Lord's Supper. Jesus is the Lamb of God. This new covenant, this new contract, if you like, replaced the old one. When Christ, who was the Passover Lamb, the perfect sinless man, Son of God, was sacrificed... And the sacrificial system that had predated this, where they were killing bulls and and lambs um, as a sacrifice to God to atone for their sins, that was no longer needed because the Lord's Supper, this Christian communion, is a remembrance of what Christ did for us. And it's a celebration of what we receive as a result of this sacrifice. Now, the band are going to come up in a moment, and they're going to lead us to sing uh, some hymns, some songs. I'm going to invite Seth to come back, and he will lead us through the communion service. But before that, I just want to say that if you don't know Jesus that we've talked about this morning, if you've never had that experience of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then you can change that right now. You see, it's it's a bit like, and I want to be as authentic as I can here. We're all sinners. We've all got it wrong. We've all gone our own way. We all think we know best. We all have some kind of belief system that we live by. But this whole thing that Jesus did when he gave his body and he died on a cross was to allow us to be reconciled with the God who loved us, the God who created us. And he just asks that we come to him, that you come as you are. And uh, some of us have led what we would consider to be pretty good lives. And others will have led what they recognize in themselves are pretty awful lives. But it doesn't matter to God. Think of it like this. If there are two pathways, and one's a muddy pathway, and it's full of holes and rocks and with sharp edges, and the other pathway is perfect and straight and clean and pristine and shining and whether you followed the pristine path or the rocky muddy path if two foot of snow falls it covers them both and you can't discern the difference In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So you see, by what Jesus did and what we're going to celebrate now, he says, your sins are not yours anymore. They belong to Jesus who died for you and carried your sins. I'm going to ask you if you just bow your heads, and I'm going to pray this prayer, and if you want to pray along with me, if you pray this in your head, and you you mean it, then your life can change right now, this morning. Let's pray. Jesus, I receive you, I receive your forgiveness and your cleansing. 
From this moment on, my faith will be in what you have done and not in my flawed performance. I repent of all the wrong ways in me and I receive you as my Savior now. Jesus, help me, guide me, save me, and teach me to walk in your ways. Amen. Now, if before this morning you, were, you would not profess to be a Christian, you didn't know Jesus, but you prayed that prayer, don't leave today without speaking to me or one of or whoever you came with or, or a friend who you know is a Christian, uh, and we'll make sure that you get some materials, some understanding, so you can go forward in your walk with the Lord. But it's the most important decision anyone can ever make in their life, and that's to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if you've done that this morning, then you join with us in the communion. For the rest of us Christians, well, think on the things that I've said before you come to the table and you share in the bread and wine. Seth. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.